Hi, I'm Rachel, and this is my Would You Read It Challenge video for August 2023. The Would You Read It Challenge was started by it to Brody. I'll link to them down below. The point of this tag is to pick an assortment of books using whatever parameters you'd like. You solely read the first sentence of the book and then ask your audience if they'd like to continue with it. But I've tweaked the tag a little bit and I've decided that one sentence isn't enough and I'm doing a couple of paragraphs per book. And I have been using the BookTube prize as my metric for choosing a new batch of books every month. I am sequentially going through some of our backlists, as it were. Uh, the BookTube prize was started by Robert and Barter Hordes. Uh, the point of the prize is to judge the best in uh, literary fiction and nonfiction uh, from the year before. Currently, we're, you know, judging 2022 books in the final round for 2023. Uh, and uh, I'm not actually allowed to talk about any of those books because uh, they're officially in the running right now. But uh, I thought I would uh, nostalgically look back on years past. Uh, and right now I'm looking at... Uh, books that we judged in 2020 in the uh, fiction rounds. And basically I'm going way back to our first rounds, which is the Octofinals, when all, when all of the long list books were in contention. Uh, and we had uh, eight uh, batches of uh, six books a piece uh, in uh, fiction, which is what I'm looking at for this tag. So anyway, uh, I thought it'd be a fun way to uh, consider all of the books from the BookTube Prize well, only by reading the first couple of paragraphs. Some of them I actually have read before, some of them I haven't. In this case, I am uh, looking at uh, the 2020 Octofinals uh, ballot for Group C, and I've read one of the six books before. But without further ado, let's get into it. I will read the paragraphs, then share the title of the book, and then give some parting thoughts. So here we go, starting with book one, the Missouri. When those men rode down to the fording place last night, I thought I was done for. I thought us done for. Either you must realize how close they came, their smell, the song of their bridles, the whites of the horse's eyes. True to form, blind though you are, and with that shot still irretrievable in your thigh, you made to stand and greet them. Perhaps I should have let you. It might have averted what happened tonight, and the girl would be unharmed. But how could I have known? I was unready, disbelieving of our fate, and in the end could only watch them cross and ride up the wash away from us in the moonlight. And wasn't I right to wait, for habit if nothing else? I knew you had flight in you yet. You still do, as do I, as I have all my life, since long before we fell in together, when I first came round to myself, six years old and already on the run, wave rocked with my father in the bunk beside me, and all around the hiss of water against the hole. It was my father running back then, though from what I never knew. He was thin, I think, young perhaps, a blacksmith perhaps, or some other hard laboring man who never caught more rest than he did that swaying month when the night and the day went undiffered and there was nothing but the creak of the rope and the pulley somewhere above us in the dark. He called me Sine, or, and some other name I have struggled lifelong to recall. Of our crossing, I remember mostly foam veins and the smell of salt, and the dead, of course, outlaid in their white shrouds side by side along the stern. And that was from Inland by Thea Obricht. Book Two, Lake Geneva, 1816. Reality is water soluble. What we could see, the rocks, the shore, the trees, the boats on the lake, had lost their usual definition and blurred into the long gray of a week's rain. Even in the house, that we fancied was made of stone, wavered inside a heavy mist and through that mist sometimes a door or window would appeared like an image in a dream. Every solid thing had dissolved into its watery equivalent. Our clothes did not dry. When we came in, and we must have come in because we must go out, we brought the weather with us, waterlogged leather, wool that stank of sheep. There is mold on my underclothes. And that was from Frankenstein by Jeanette Winterson. Book three. I was born without a voice, one cold overcast day in Brooklyn, New York. No one ever spoke of my condition. I did not know I was mute until years later when I opened my mouth to ask for what I wanted and realized no one could hear me. Where I come from, 
Voicelessness is the condition of my gender, as normal as the bosoms on a woman's chest, as necessary as the next generation growing inside her belly. But we will never tell you this, of course. Where I come from, we've learned to conceal our condition. We've been taught to silence ourselves, that our silence will save us. It is only now, many years later, that I know this to be false. Only now, as I write this story, do I feel my voice coming. And that was from A Woman Is No Man by A Tough Room. Book four. Do not let Mother Dear find us. Mother Dear, Nikolai said. I was surprised. He used to only call me that when I wasn't paying attention. But here I was, holding on to my attentiveness, because that was all I could do for him now. I've never told you how much I love you calling me that, I said. What did you call Grandma? When I was your age? Mamita, I said. That was endearing, he said. You have to get the name right when you find the person hard to endear, I said. Endear, I thought. What an odd word. Endear. Endure. Endear. Endear. Can you outdear someone? And that was from Where Reasons End by Yu Yun Li. Book five. I am 30 years old and that is nothing. I know what that sounds like and I hesitate to begin with something so obvious, but let me say it anyway, at the risk of sounding naive. And let it stand alongside this. Six years ago, a man I knew vanished from his home in the mountains. He vanished in part because of me, because of certain things I said, but also things I did not have, until now, the courage to say. So you see, there is nothing to be gained by pretending to a wisdom I do not possess. What I am, what I was, and what I have done, all of these things will become clear soon enough. And that was from The Far Field by Madhuri Vijay. And finally, book six. Now what we don't want is facts. What we want is bewilderment. What we want is repetition. What we want is repetition. What we want is people in power saying the truth is not the truth. What we want is elected members of parliament saying knife getting heated, stuck in her front, and twisted things like bringing your own noose. We want governing members of parliament in the House of Commons shouting kill yourself at opposition members of parliament. We want powerful people saying they want other powerful people chopped up in bags in my freezer. We want Muslim women as a joke in a newspaper column. We want the laugh, we want the sound of that laugh behind them everywhere they go. We want people we call foreign to feel foreign. We need to make it clear they can't have rights unless we say so. What we want is outrage, offense, distraction. What we need is to say thinking is elite knowledge is elite. What we need is people feeling left behind, disenfranchised. What we need is people feeling. And that was from Spring by Allie Smith. Okay, so my thought with a lot of these is uh, I feel like pretty much all of these uh, beginnings were kind of talking around the issue. There was a lot of sort of gimmickiness with these. Uh, and maybe I'll actually save the book I read for last, which I feel like I had the easiest time getting through, so it's probably a good thing. Uh, but anyway, like, um, in Inland, uh, the, 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 the narrator seems to be talking to us, uh, but we're supposed to know something that we don't know. That's, that's what it seems like to me. Like, like, like uh. I mean, because there's a you in here too, you standing to greet them and that sort of thing. So it infers that we're part of the scene and uh, have some facts that we don't have as the narrator is uh, just uh, kind of talking to us like a friend. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, just unknowns. Uh, I mean, and not just, uh, I mean, there's, I mean, it's not just unknowns as in, you know, it'll be explained later, but like, you know, we're in the middle of a scene and there's no setup for exactly where we are. Like, you know, the men are riding to a fording place, and I think that's pretty much all we know about the setting of where these characters even are. And so, I mean, and you know, the narrator's asking you questions that, of course, we won't know because, you know, we're not the character in the story. So I feel like it's just deliberately, like, uh, starting in a uh, vague sort of place, uh, and we're just supposed to be along for the ride. And then we have Frank Histein by Jeanette Winterson, which what I remember, I think, back in the day was Britta Bowler really liked this book. And to me, I think this is a lot of scene setting of saying, we're in a house and it's really wet here. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of, everything is in here. There's no characters, there's uh, no sort of emotional, personal stakes. It's just basically saying that uh, everything in and out of the house is really wet. <laughs> so, uh, 
And then like the final line, there is mold on my underclothes. Uh, I think that's like the first thing that feels like it's uh, very personal. <laughs> uh, but it takes us a few paragraphs to get there. And I'll skip book three because that's the one I've read and I'll go on to book four, which uh, first of all, there's no quotation marks in this this book it seems like and that's a big pet peeve of mine it's an you know unlike the others so far it's an actual scene with dialogue except you can barely tell the dialogue because there's no quotation marks <laughs> and again there's not a lot happening i mean nikolai is uh basically trying to start a conversation or, or we don't actually even know why he said mother dear because it immediately goes off the rails because uh, she says, oh, I love hearing you say that. And then he, you know, takes that thread into a new uh, conversation. So what we learn is uh, that uh, the mother called her mother Mamita. <laughs> That's about it. And then she, like in her head, goes on this, like, you know, tangent about, like, uh, thinking through words and, like, how, what they sound like. And so it doesn't really mean much, although it does seem sort of appropriate for sometimes uh what people's uh, minds sound like when they're distracted. And, and maybe that belies the point from above where uh, it seems like uh, she, she's trying to claim she's paying attention, but maybe she isn't because her mind is wandering. So perhaps that's intriguing <laughs> on its own. <laughs> uh, and then the far field uh, in book five, I don't know, this is, uh, I think it's supposed to start with a uh, sort of uh, blunt and arresting sentence. I am 30 years old and that's nothing, but kind of like the last one, it kind of rambles on into something else. Like it says, well, that sounds weird, but let me go into this random anecdote about a man I knew six years ago that vanished in the mountains. And you know, again, so it's like we're starting in the middle of a scene where we have little context. Like, you know, why are we talking about a man vanishing in the mountains? Where are we right now? <laughs> Uh, and uh, the narrator blames herself for some things she uh, said, but also some things she didn't know how to say, which again is just sort of teasing us with, you know, we'll hear about that later in the future. Uh, and then again, she is talking to a you again, which is supposed to be us. Uh, although at least I guess in this case, I, I don't know if uh, we're supposed to know much about this character, although she's she or he is not telling us very much. <laughs> uh, it's just supposed to be sort of vague and enticing for being vague, like with the last sentence about, you know, all, well, well, like it literally ends with all of the things I'm saying are about to become clear, but we're not going to start with clear. We're going to ramble on for the beginning of the, of the, of the, uh, <laughs> of, of this uh, book, chapter one. And then finally, uh, book six is uh, Spring by Allie Smith, which is a part of her quartet uh, that's named after seasons. And I think it's supposed to, um, correlate to uh, British politics and this one certainly does uh, talk a lot about politics and you know as an American it feels very familiar to me what uh, Ali Smith seems to be critiquing is um, the sort of alarmist cynical politics of uh, not wa wanting to be anti-intellectual wanting to you know uh, put some us versus them uh, mentality into dealing with people who are different than us, like to, you know, sort of blame all our problems on them. I mean, this stuff is uh, pretty uh, easy to decipher given the world we are living in right now. Uh, the actual writing is, uh, I think, the most stream of consciousness. I mean, a lot of these aren't actually fully formed sentences or something like that. It's just going on from one thought to the next. Uh, and uh, again, there's no physical scene setting or anything like that. It is basically um, a set of ideas about the uh, emotional political realities we live in. This is one of those things where uh, things look a little bit different on the page because some of the uh, text uh, is uh, in bigger fonts and I, you know, for issues of making things easier on myself, I didn't do any bigger fonts, I didn't do italics for other things, you know, that sort of stuff. Uh, so. I feel like it's more intriguing to read on the page, but it's a little more difficult to read aloud because of all of uh, the, the syntax uh, that, uh, that isn't really uh, proper. <laughs> so uh, I, I feel like a lot of these books, uh, they just, they're kind of a high bar of entry. Like they're not necessarily uh, taking us into a very succinct, realist reality. Uh, but I'll uh, end by talking about the last book, which is the book I read, which is A Woman Is No Man. And I feel like uh, the, I be began technically by reading the prologue. Uh, and it is definitely a little removed from the rest of the book because uh, she's the, the main character is basically giving a treatise of I had no voice. 
Uh, and what follows will be me actually telling my story, even though what you can tell from this first paragraph where she talks about how voicelessness is a natural condition for people of her gender, uh, she's telling us that she's never had the means to communicate this story before. And anyway, this writing definitely, to me, feels the most uh, approachable and easy to read. Uh, this was the book, I think, that made it the uh, longest uh, into the Book Two Prize. I think it made it to the semifinals. I'm not sure if any of the others made it that far. They, none of them made it into the final round. Um, and this is a book uh, which I think started a little bit of a renaissance of uh, novels written by Palestinian American women. And we're following these two narrators in the story, uh, um, a mother and a daughter in two dual timelines uh, who uh, are basically stuck in a uh, familial situation where uh, they are forced into marriages and other things that they don't want to do but you know the men tell them they have to and I think there's some uh, you know storyline elements of abuse in here and there's of course uh, commentary on uh, how all of this is impacted by uh, their status as uh, refugees or lifting, living in occupied territory or, or, you know, living in diaspora from that territory. Uh, so this was certainly, for me, the uh, thing that could make it challenging is for me as a, as a, a Jewish person that uh, Israel means something very different uh, to me uh, within my uh, personal life and my communal uh, life and identity. Uh, but of course, it's very important to uh, hear... Uh, to hear Palestinian narratives as well uh, for me. Uh, but uh, I feel like this one, I, I think uh, I struggled with a little bit, uh, but, but I, I wonder if I've read it again, maybe I'd uh, you know have an easier time because I'm, uh, I've primed myself a little more to uh, you know uh, read this literature. And I do, I suppose, generally have a hard time with the push and pull between you know showing um, an abusive system versus like sort of giving your abusive characters like carte blanche uh, uh you know excuses for being abusive although i'm not sure that's really what rum was doing with her abusive male characters i'm not sure she was fully letting them off the hook uh, so anyway uh, i do feel like i don't know you know i haven't read any of the other books and i feel like uh, i'm not sure i'd want to uh, at least not from anything i read on the page uh, maybe i'd want to read frankenstein just because i know britta buller i think she liked it you know if i remember a video from years and years ago <laughs> but uh yeah i guess uh, that's where i will leave things now with my uh, preliminary thoughts and uh, i will have links to the goodreads pages for all of these books down below as well as my review of a woman is no man and I will be back on this channel hopefully very soon to do my very last AM reading video of the month. Still have a bunch of uh, new reading I want to cram in, uh, including, uh, well, I'm not sure I'm going to do any more booktube prize reading this month. Uh, I'm actually more ahead on the prize than usual because uh, I did some uh, reading of my ballot before uh, the finals ballot started, the finals round started, so I'm more ahead than usual, so that's really exciting, but I certainly don't want to rest on my laurels too long, and it could very well mean then that uh, I'll be racing toward the finish line as usual next month, but I guess we'll have to see how that goes. So, uh, I'd love to hear any of your thoughts about these books, if you've read them or not, or uh, how you're doing with uh, your booktube prize reading, if uh, you're taking part in the finals round this year, and yeah, that's all I have. Thanks so much for watching, everyone, and I'll see you next time.